Good afternoon. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about active field theories for a few lectures. Um, and I'll hopefully navigate the backboard somehow. So I'll start by giving you a kind of conceptual map uh, to do with field theories in soft matter generally. Oops. You'll find I break the chalk every 30 seconds throughout my lectures. Um, so the sort of ideas map is this. We have statics, which in most systems means equilibrium thermodynamics. We have dynamics, how systems reach equilibrium or uh, move when they're maintained away from equilibrium. And we have uh, some kind of microscopic models as input. And we also have symmetries and conservation laws. So these are things we know about in each particular case. And from these, we construct uh, some sort of set of order parameters, coarse-grained order parameters. Uh, and I will give many examples of these later on. Broken chalk again. So I'm going to call those psi of R and T. And uh, in equilibrium systems, so passive systems, we can also uh, think about, as in this column, equilibrium statistical physics of these psi fields, uh, from which we can get probabilities So these are probabilities for states, for configurations of the system, which I'm going to denote by an ordinary capital P of psi of R. No time dependence there. And this will be the Boltzmann distribution. So in dynamics, we have to do a bit more than that. From here, um, also by coarse graining, we can develop uh, what I would call uh, uh, PDE, so differential equations for the time to evolution of these continuous order parameter fields, things like density, uh, polarization, uh, velocity in a fluid, etc. So that gives us what we'll call hydrodynamic, in quotes, PDEs, which are deterministic, they are of the form rate of change of order parameters equals something deterministic involving the order parameters. If we want to think, though, about uh, how we uh, achieve, say, a Boltzmann distribution, so a, a probability distribution for different configurations, it's no good having deterministic equations of motion. There must be noise, otherwise the system won't sample different configurations and won't ever recover the Boltzmann distribution. So we can draw an arrow here and talk about stochastic PDEs. So these stochastic PDEs are, for the purposes of this course, the field theories. They're dynamical field theories for order parameter fields. And uh, the course will be about, uh, today I'll talk mostly about how, what these look like for passive systems, but Obviously, the main part of the course will be talking about those for active systems. So the stochastic PDEs will be also like this. Similar bunch, if not identical bunch, of deterministic terms, examples later, plus some noise. And from these, we can construct the probability densities, not for configurations, but for paths, in other words, for evolutions, for uh, evolutions of this whole thing. So I'm going to put a new symbol for that, which is a, a P with a open vertical bar. Um, and this is a functional of 
the path or the whole trajectory in time of uh, order parameters as a function of time and space. So these are path weights. So on top of this, and in a different color, I'm going to draw a couple of further connections. Well, the main one actually is from here. So in, in uh, s systems which have the Boltzmann distribution as their steady state, uh, it's possible to use that and basically, uh, it's, it's using, and I'll come back to this again later, it's using the mi microscopic reversibility of the physical equations underneath to constrain these equations, in particular, this. The fact that the Boltzmann distribution has to be recovered in steady state, so let me call this arrow number two. I know that sounds strange, but it's going to be an arrow number one in a minute. Um, this fact constrains the noise terms. In other words, if I know what the deterministic terms in this equation are, I also know, know the noise terms. So 2 equals fluctuation dissipation theorem. And there'll be explicit examples of that later. Uh, but there's also another route which is direct from microscopic models which are what I coarse grain to get these uh, continuous uh, equations of motion for the coarse grained order parameters to the stochastic BDEs. In other words, if I do my coarse graining with enough precision, I can not only work out what are the deterministic terms in this kind of equation, but also the noise terms. So this is root one. And the comment at this stage, which will occupy us a bit later on, is that in active systems, I have no Boltzmann distribution. And another way of saying that, as it will turn out, is no time reversal symmetry. in the underlying microscopics. So this means that root two is blocked. So what I'm going to do today is, with various examples, uh, talk about how we construct these hydrodynamic equations and then the stochastic versions in passive systems. And then in following lectures, I will talk more about the direct route and how we proceed in the active case. Any questions? Okay, so let me say a bit more about the kind of things we're talking about. Order parameters. And of course, some of these you'll have seen in previous lectures, but I just want to provide a list here. So this could be a density. Usually we call that rho. Uh, it might be a velocity in a fluid. So these are all functions of R and T. If I have a mixture of two types of particle, it could be a composition variable. But it could also be a polarization. If I have particles with some kind of arrow on them, those could be swimming particles, but they could be anything else. So that would be P. So oriented swimmers would be an example of that. Um, but if I have something with pneumatic order, so orientational order, but not a, 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 an axial order, but not an actual uh, plus or minus direction in space, we need a pneumatic order parameter Q, which is a traceless second rank tensor. So axis, not orientation. And again, there'll be examples of that later on. So uh, the next thing is to give uh, a you an idea of what equations at this level look like. Well, there's one of those which most of you probably know, and that's this the case for 
uh, the velocity in a uh, incompressible fluid for simplicity, which is the Navier-Stokes equation. So uh, let me. I'm going to make another common column here, if you don't mind. So I'll do hydro level and then stochastic. So first example then, A, momentum conserving incompressible one component fluid. So the hydro equation is hopefully reasonably familiar to most of you. A density which is constant, V dot plus V dot grad V equals viscosity del squared V minus grad P now is pressure, nothing to do with that P over there. So this is the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, and auxiliary to that, the pressure field big P is chosen such that div V equals naught. So that's a closed set of equations for the velocity. Um, so hopefully you've all seen the Navier-Stokes equation before or something very like it. But something which is uh, sadly missing from most lecture courses on fluid dynamics, which basically write down that equation uh, in the first five minutes and then spend 30 lectures solving it, um, is that this is deterministic. And so if you're interested in the statistical mechanics of fluids, you have to go beyond that level. You have to have a stochastic version of this. So if we now add noise to this, I'm just going to tell you how it works, and then we'll ha have an example of doing this properly uh, later on. Uh, what we need to do, let's do this in a different color, is add on the right-hand side this. So that's a stress tensor. I can also think of this as the divergence of a stress tensor, the viscous stress. This is the divergence of a stress tensor, which is a random stress caused by the fact that at some lower level than this continuum description, the fluid is made of molecules, and the molecules have random thermal motion and so, although this is a deterministic equation, which if I just let it run, would evolve to a state where V was equal to zero everywhere, that's not what fluids do. Fluids have a temperature, and there's a thermal velocity which is fluctuating in space and time everywhere all the time. So to recover that, which is the Boltzmann distribution for the fluid, because it has a density and a velocity, so it has a, a thermal kinetic energy density, I need a noise term. So the other piece of information I need is what is the statistics of that noise? And as I've intimated, but will not uh, prove for this model, but will show for a simpler one later on, um, the fluctuation dissipation theorem, in, the, in other words, the fact that this should give me the Boltzmann distribution for fluctuations of velocity as its steady state measure, um, fixes this noise. And the result is sigma ij. So this is a second rank tensor n function of r t sigma KL, R prime, T prime, average is 2 KBT times the viscosity times some delta functions. And these delta functions are delta IL, delta JK plus delta IK, delta JL, and then there's a delta function of r minus r prime and a delta function of t minus t prime. So this is very formal. What it says, though, this is basically a, a, a white noise, a tensorial white noise with a certain amplitude here. The amplitude is proportional to the viscosity. So that's dissipation. This is fluctuation. Fluctuation dissipation theorem says if I tell you the dissipation, and I impose the Boltzmann distribution as my steady state measure, I can deduce the amplitude and character of the noise, and it's also proportional to temperature for reasons which should be reasonably obvious, that the more, the higher the temperature, the more thermal motion there has to be. 
So this is via FTT. And if you want a challenge, would be to try to derive that not via FTT. Uh, so you can see that when we don't have uh, a Boltzmann distribution underneath that we can appeal to, a, a direct route can be difficult. Austin. Momentum. Yeah, so the, the th that's a good point. This is the this is the qu equation for conservation of momentum. Rate of change of momentum of a piece of fluid co-moving with the fluid, that's the left-hand side, is the divergence of a stress tensor which involves uh, the viscous stress, and that comes through as del squared V here. Uh, this uh, is uh, P is like a diagonal uh, bit of the stress tensor whose job is to conserve volume. So by the time you've done that, maybe it's conserving mass as well. Um, and then there's a fluctuating stress. If I, as you say, if I didn't have a div here, I would not have momentum conservation in the equation overall. Um, well, you wouldn't normally have d by dt of p. You'd have an equation of state relating p to some like the density, for instance. That would be the usual. To, for a compressible fluid, you'd normally have P of rho there and another equation telling you P as a function of rho. Okay, so that's an, an example. Another one which is going to be much closer to the active models that I'll mainly be talking about later in the course is coming next, and that's a, the hydrodynamic level description, so this level and then that level of description for interacting Brownian particles without momentum conservation. So I'm going to erase, and so if there are any more questions while I do that or before, shout now. So example B. Interacting random particles. As I said, no momentum conservation, still passive. So um, these are described by density. And the hydrodynamic level description for them is that the rate of change of density is the negative divergence of some current or other. And the reason for this div here is conservation of mass. So closely related to the div over there. In other words, if I don't have a div there, the integral of rho is not conserved, and so particles can be created and destroyed out of the vacuum. We don't want that for this particular model. I need to know how the current behaves, and this is at the hydrodynamic level, um, and it's going to be something like this. This M is called a mobility, which could, in principle, depend on the disposition of particles, in other words, where different particles are, so it could functionally depend on the density field, uh, it won't, but I'm being more general than I need to be for the moment, times the gradient of a chemical potential. This again is passive. Um, so two comments there. Firstly, um, this mobility can also be written rho, beta, so beta is 1 over kt as usual, times a diffusion constant. So if the diffus diffusivity of particles depend on where other particles are, which they could do if they're interacting, uh, that's still a relation between diffusion and mobility, which is uh, related by uh, one power of density and kt. Uh, and for simplicity, I'm going to assume that this depends only locally on the density hereafter. Uh, the chemical potential here, mu, is the derivative of a free energy functional. So df by d rho. f of rho is the free energy. Uh, and interactions live in the functional form of this free energy. So depending on the type of interactions, I have a different function or functional for the free energy rho. So an example of that 
would be beta f is integral rho log rho minus 1. This is dr. So that would be an ideal gas plus some interactions, which might take the following form. This is not general, but it's uh, an example. So this would, for instance, describe some soft, squidgy interaction potential V as a pair potential between particles at R1 and R2. So I just see how many particles there are at each place, look at the difference in separation, multiply by V in the two rows. So this is a, a soft pairwise interaction, say. So a coarse graining of an explicit model might lead me to a form like this for the free energy. But this structure is, is more general. It requires uh, no specific information here as to the form of the free energy except through mu, uh, w which is where the interaction forces then, then enter. So this is deterministic again. So this is hydrodynamic level. And again, I can add noise. Uh, I can find the correct noise terms to add to this equation by appeal to the Boltzmann distribution as the steady state solution of it. So I'm going to erase again and start over here. Uh, any questions about this? Well, um, this equation can't change when I add noise because it's conservation law. The noise is going to come in for J. There will be a noisy term in J, just as there was a noisy term in the stress in the Navier-Stokes equation. So J becomes this. So uh, that's, yeah, I can write that. M, I can write this way, having said the relation between m and d, grad mu, plus jn, so that's a noise current, and the noise current has the following statistics. We can write it 2 rho d rho, square root, I'm going to write this times a vector lambda, and this lambda has the following statistics, rt lambda j r prime t prime equals delta ij delta r minus r prime delta t minus t prime. So uh, this is something we're going to call unit white noise and this is vector noise but so the point about this is that there's no correlation between different Cartesian components so there's no correlation uh, between the noise at different places or different times. That, of course, is an exaggeration. What these things, delta functions, really mean on the right-hand side, that's a real one, proper Kronecker delta. But this means that there's some very short-ranged correlation in space and a short-ranged correlation in time. And I give them unit integral. So I replace those by delta functions such that each integrates to unity. And then, uh, and this is also going to be Gaussian. So for now, I'm just telling you, and again, there will be an explicit example later on. I'm telling you that if I choose that amplitude multiplying my Gaussian white noise as the random current, then these equations with this extra term here give me the Boltzmann distribution, namely P of rho is e to the minus beta f of rho times normalization. So that's what uh, equilibrium system, system mechanics tells me. And in order to get that, I have to choose particularly this, 
this prefactor here, which is interesting because in principle this depends on the density. So this is multiplicative noise, so-called. This is independent of, of anything, but it says that the noise in space and time actually depends on the uh, disposition of the density where the particles are. Uh, and so there are general generalizations of this to many other problems as well. Um, so I will just say note multiplicative noise. So that is something which will plague us a bit later on because multiplicative noise is generally difficult. And indeed, to avoid that, um, there's a kind of canonical way of simplifying this model uh, to describe the same sort of physics in a way which uh, avoids some of the otherwise difficult technical problems associated with that kind of noise and also with the generality of this free energy functional here, which could be in principle arbitrarily complicated. So if I may go back over here, I'll try to think of a way of using the board more efficiently. Really, I should be cutting it into four, so I'll try and do that now. Uh, any questions about this? That I can see an incipient question in the middle here. You've been frowning for five minutes, so. Well, the noise is connected with the ideal gas part of the free energy, uh, but, without, uh, but these equations here are deterministic. Uh, so if I just had that, um, I put particles in a box and I just uh, solve those equations with a t certain number of particles, instead of getting the Boltzmann distribution, which is that I have a fluctuating density given by an ideal gas, I will get a uniform density. So I'll get the mean density instead of the fluctuations about the mean. So that's why I need the noise. Good question, though. Done. Yes, so uh, I, was, I didn't call that a density functional, uh, and I don't think of it in quite that way. It's something which controls the fluctuations of the density as opposed to uh, controlling the, uh, the mean density under given external conditions. Over here. Um, well, it's actually, it's, it's, it's here. So I could write that as a, K, a, a 2 KTM. So it's just because I, I just exploited the relation between M and D. Yeah. Oh, well that's just me trying to say something. Um, well, okay. So imagine that this was some kind of squidgy, highly differentiable potential, uh, not some kind of hardcore thing. Then um, it's reasonable to say I just look at where the particles are, multiply by the their interaction and do the double integral. If I had some kind of hardcore thing, I would have to worry a bit more about how to write this. That's all I meant. It doesn't have to be so. Yeah. Okay. So unsurprisingly, uh, in later lectures, the case of interacting active Brownian particles will be one which concerns us considerably, and that's why I wanted to uh, establish this stuff now. So what I'm going to call a canonical, I told you the chalk would break, of case B, which actually will turn into something called model B. So first, Taylor expand the free energy functional in weak gradients about a reference density. Rho naught. So I can write phi is rho minus rho naught. So I used this symbol for composition earlier, but it turns out that this is the mathematics is the same. So this is just a shift of the shifted density. Um, and beta f 
if I Taylor expand in small deviations from rho naught and in the weak gradients, then I can expect something like the following, which will be familiar to many of you. So a couple of notes here. Uh, firstly, in general, you might expect a cubic term. But I've chosen to remove this by a appropriate choice of rho zero. In other words, I can always choose rho zero so that the third derivative of this uh, local free energy here uh, vanishes. And what that means is if I have a system which is going to have some kind of critical point, rho zero will be at the critical point. So I can get rid of the cubic term by appropriate choice there. Um, and also I've omitted a linear term here, which in general would be present if I have chosen phi so that the cubic term vanishes. Um, but that uh, can be removed for the following reason. Integral of phi dr is v times phi bar is a constant at fixed contents. So as long as I have a t fixed total number of particles in my container, um, a term here which was of the form integral h phi would be a constant, so I can leave it out. So integral h phi equals a constant, equals irrelevant. And this also implies that, uh, if, in print what it would do if I take the, the derivative of this, um, I would find that it just gives a constant shift. in the chemical potential mu. And if you remember the dynamic equations, which are still there, because the only way mu enters is by a grad mu, so that would again have no effect at all on the dynamics here. So I can remove the cubic term and forget the linear term. So that's the first thing I did. And the second, which is uh, a, a specifically dealing with the mess here associated with uh, multiplicative noise, so second, one line down here. So approximate m of phi, which is this local function that is that. Um, so I can write that as uh, of a kt phi plus rho naught d phi plus rho naught. So that's just reading across what m of phi actually is. I'm going to approximate that by a constant value, which is beta rho naught d of rho naught. So this will all work if I'm in a system which has a reference density, and I never go very far from that in terms of the actual densities that the system experiences. So obviously there are approximations here, but these are approximations are worth it. Because firstly, this might be true further away. I mean, it's perfectly possible that emerging from some microscopic model, I would have a nearly constant mo mobility factor here. And secondly, as I say, in th this particular case, the importance of that is to remove the multiplicative nature of the noise term here, because this then just becomes a constant. So just writing these equations out again briefly then phi dot equals minus div j, j equals minus constant m, so this is now constant m grad mu plus the noise term, j noise is now constant square root 2m times unit white noise, so no longer multiplicative. and mu is df by d phi with that f, which is a phi square, uh, phi just linear, sorry, a phi plus b phi cubed minus k del squared phi. 
So this is a kind of nicer thing to deal with than the chemical potential coming out of a model with an interacting rho log rho ideal gas, etc. Irene. Where? Yes, they should. Thank you. Correct in notes. This is the advantage of not scanning my notes before giving them to you. Or you know what I mean. Not scanning my notes until after lecturing them. Could hardly not scan them before giving to you. <laughs> I'd be left with no notes. Anyway, right. Um, okay. So this is called model B. So uh, quite a lot of our time in later lectures will be constructing and looking at an active version of model B. So anyway, this is it's a rather unhelpful name. Um, you can blame Hernberg and Halperin for, uh, for it. So they wrote this RevMod Phys paper in 1977, which in introduced models A, B, C, H, J, etc. Um, mnemonic B for Brownian. That's not what they were thinking of at all, but anyway, helpful. Okay, so um, just to carry on along the same line, uh, let's think a bit more about then the thermodynamics of this, like what's the Boltzmann distribution for model B? So this will be familiar to many of you, but it's probably is quite good to even if it's revision because this will all change uh, in the active counterparts later on. So um, beta f is still there, so I won't write it out again. Uh, for negative a, b will always be positive, by the way. But for negative a, what I can do is I can look at the local part of this which I shall abuse the blackboard by now labeling as f of phi. So little f of phi is the local part of the free energy density. Uh, so we can easily see what that looks like. It looks like this. Oops. And on here I can mark some important things. First is the point of uh, inflection here where this becomes of uh, negative curvature. So this is plus phi s minus phi s, phi s being the spinodal density or composition. And the second important thing is the minima at minus phi b and plus phi b. Okay. So phi b is the binodal and it's given by minus a over b square root. Phi s is the spinodal, and it's given by minus a over 3b square root. And if I have a double well structure like this, the system is locally unstable in the region of negative curvature. In other words, if I start the system there and evolve it with the dynamics of model B, it will immediately uh, become non-uniform if I start with it uniform. So let's start a new column here locally unstable for mod phi less than phi s and globally unstable so the uniform state I'm referring to here phi b so between phi s and phi b I have uh, nucleated instability. In other words, the system can lower its free energy if it started here. It can lower its free energy into by having phase coexistence of some of that and some of this, but it has a barrier to get over before it can do that. Um, conservation of stuff. So the idea is that by the time the system has globally minimized its free energy, there will be fluctuations about this, but uh, in an average sense, it will choose to make two states of coexisting 
uh, at the binodal densities because by doing that I can drop the bulk part of the free energy onto a horizontal line here. I'll say more about this in a minute. Um, so I will have phase coexistence of plus minus phi b. So say I have some of plus phi b here and an interface and some of minus phi b there. And say that's v1 and that's v2. Then v1 plus v2 equals v, the volume of my system. And v1 minus v2 times phi b is v times phi bar. So you can just work that out from the linear algebra of uh, the definition of phi and rho. But the point is then that the amounts of these phases are fixed by the global composition phi bar. That's the thing I have control over. I know how many particles I put in my container. The densities of these two phases are the ones that allow the system to minimize its free energy by dropping the uh, average free energy onto a horizontal line across here. So this is fixed by contents or initial conditions. So if I start model B anywhere in between these two uh, densities with a uniform state, it will end up like that. Uh, it may take a long time if you're in the region where you have to nucleate, but the noise terms are there. You will nucleate eventually the system will find the Boltzmann distribution. Okay, uh, so I just want to uh, generalize this slightly in a way which again will be familiar to man many of you because uh, again, this will be helpful later on when we come back to compare and contrast with the active case. So I'm going to start rubbing this out. So are there any questions on what's up here? Yeah, sorry? Stuff. Stuff. Sorry. Matter. Particles. So now I'm going to improve my board discipline even further by drawing a vertical line before writing. What are we doing on time? It's half time. Let's take a five minute break.
Okay, well that's four minutes anyway, so I think everyone's back. <laughs> right, so let's uh, just, uh, while we're talking about the thermodynamics, uh, let me generalize that just a little bit. Again, this sh will should be familiar to most of you, uh, but again, it's something which will change when we think about active systems, so I want to just lay a marker for this. So more generally, so the choice of F here is symmetric about phi equals zero. Uh, that's not always going to be true for every system. If I have an F as a function of some scalar conserved variable phi, which looks like this, for example, so this is going to be sort of somehow, oops, off symmetric. There's going to be a coexistence between a density around here, phi two and phi one. And uh, as many of you will know, I expect, the correct construction for this is to draw a line which is tangent to the free energy, local free energy curve and lies everywhere below it. So the reason for that is the following. Um, if I have passive phase coexistence, it requires two things. Firstly, that the chemical potentials in the two coexisting phases are the same. Those are given by df by d phi, the derivative of the local part of the free energy. So this is the, the bulk chemical potential. I don't need to worry about the uh, gradient terms when comparing these two bulk phases here. So this at phi 1 equals df d phi at phi 2. So this is the same as saying mu 1 equals mu 2. And it's also the same as saying equal slope. In other words, I have to construct a, 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 a line here that has the same slope at both points, otherwise I will not have the same chemical potential at both points. But then there's a second uh, condition, which is equality of pressure. So phi 1 mu 1 minus F of phi 1 equals P1. That's a thermodynamic relation between the pressure and the chemical potential and the density, which you probably last saw in some thermodynamics lectures many years ago, but it's nonetheless uh, always true. And this is equals P2 and is again phi 2 mu 2 uh, minus F phi 2. And this says equal intercept. In other words, if you think geometrically about this object, uh, it's the negative of the interception point of this line with the vertical axis. So function times derivative minus uh, ordinate times derivative minus, minus the, the vertical. So this is equality of thermodynamic pressure. So the word thermodynamic here is redundant in uh, passive systems because all the pressures you might think of defining in a passive equilibrium system are the same, but um, I just put that there for reference. So I have equal slope and equal intercept, and this implies what's called the common tangent construction. of which drawing a horizontal line across here is a specific example. And what happens then is if you start with a density in the middle here, by making a coexistence between this state and that state, the bulk part of the free energy drops onto the blue line, which lies below, and therefore the system will always find a way to do that if it's going to uh, be in equilibrium and it's able to, by the Boltzmann distribution of fluctuations, to find the global minimum rather than some local minimum in the free energy. Okay, uh, so let's uh, move on from there. So there's one thing I want to do uh, uh, just to add to this, and it's a slight change, so I'm going to move over here. So this was called Model B, and I uh, presented it to you as for a one-component system with a certain density. But the same mathematics can equally describe a binary fluid system. So let me just make that point. So binary fluid interpretation 
a model B. So um, I have an interdiffusing mixture of two species, row one, row two, and if I'm going to have an incompressible fluid, let's suppose that these add up to a constant. So I, wherever I look, I may have A or B molecules with the same total density, but I can have different amounts of them in different places. I can define an order parameter, which is telling me about whether what the uh, relative composition is like. So let's define that as row 1 minus row 2 over row 1 plus row 2. This is a constant, so it's not particularly material. And then I can define an order parameter without the tilde by the same trick as before uh, as phi tilde minus some reference point, which is actually the critical point, uh, to remove the cubic term. So the point about this is that that phi, which is a linear transformation of these rows, is still a conserved variable. I can't change it locally without shuffling stuff, actual material, from one place to another. So phi still conserved. So um, phi dot is minus div j, as before. And again, j equals minus some mobility, which could depend on phi, but for simplicity, we're going to take, treat as constant, times the gradient of df by d phi. So that's a chemical potential like quantity that tells phi which way to try to move and with a, j a noise term as before. So this is model B again, just read differently to mean composition variable rather than overall density. And for A negative, this describes liquid-liquid demixing in a system without momentum conservation. Um, so that, of course, raises the question about what about a system which has got momentum conservation, because by the time, at least in three dimensions, I'm talking about a, a, a fluid made of two species and they start demixing, you uh, should worry about what uh, the effect of momentum conservation has on the equations of motion. So the wha wha to derive model B, if you remember, I started by having Brownian motion of particles. Uh, so that doesn't conserve momentum. If I, if I you know, V is doesn't really even get, get a definition for a, a Brownian particle. Um, but if I have a, a, a liquid made of two types of molecule, even if they're interdiffusing, there's still a global momentum, which is the sum of the velocities of all the particles in the neighborhood, and that has to be conserved. So uh, it turns out that if I want to add momentum conservation, I end up with something which I'll just talk about briefly next, which is called model H. So with momentum, So H, again, is just some arbitrary letter chosen by Hernberg and Halperin, but um, maybe you can mnemonic it by thinking about hydrodynamic interactions between particles or something like that. So this is still passive. And what it's going to have is going to have something like model B coupled to a Navier-Stokes equation. So let's uh, see what that gives us. Well, if you think about a, a composition variable which is attached to a fluid, the fluid now has a velocity, velocity v. So I can write a conservation law for that as usual, but it's now going to have a v dot grad phi term in it. And this is minus div j. So this says that I have a conserved particles, so I have a conserved scalar phi for the composition. But this says that in addition to uh, a, a diffusive flux here, I have an advective flux, which is basically pushing the composition around according to the local velocity of the fluid. So if I have a patch of a certain composition that's moving with speed v, then that's this term tells me that it has moved to a new position so that phi has changed. So this is a co-moving derivative.
so just like the term in the Navier-Stokes equation for V, in fact. Uh, J is the usual. Unchanged. And now in the Navier-Stokes equation, I have to uh, see what happens to that. Well, let's write it down as it was before. V dot plus V dot grad V. So that's the uh, co-moving time derivative of the momentum density. So we had this as eta del squared V, which can also be written as the divergence of a viscous stress, uh, minus grad P, P being pressure. And I had the noise term. And now there's another term. And the other term becomes from the fact that these particles are interacting with each other. So there are forces between different areas of fluid caused by the different interactions between particles of type 1 and particles of type 2. So this must also be the divergence of a stress for the same reason as before, otherwise I wouldn't have proper conservation of momentum. So I can write that as the divergence of some stress, which I shall write superscript phi on it. So, so this stress comes from the free energy structure. So if I know f as a function of phi, I should be able to calculate what that is. Um, and so ultimately, it comes from interparticle forces. As ultimately all stresses must, of course, do. OK, so I'm not going to derive this stress. What matters is its divergence. And in fact, div sigma phi equals minus phi grad mu, where mu is the derivative of functional derivative of f. And um, Julien Tailleur, when inviting us to lecture, said, oh, you must prepare problems for the students. Now, I imagine that you've probably got exhausted with the idea of doing anything other than attend lectures about two weeks ago. Nonetheless, uh, there will be some problems available for those who are interested. And if you need to know uh, where this comes from, you can solve problem one. There are various heuristic ways of deriving it. You can think of it as a sort of force-like thing acting on an average density. But uh, the only way I know to do it properly is in problem one. So this shows the general structure for a system with a scalar order parameter and momentum conservation. So it's talking to a fluid through the fluid velocity. OK. So again, I'm going to park that because it's something that will recur in a sort of active counterpart in later lectures. So. Um, what I'm going to actually do in most of the following lectures is to uh, derive by explicit coarse graining uh, things like this, specifically active version of model B. I'll say a little bit about active versions of model, model H. But uh, you will also have seen or are yet to see a lot of other uh, field theory models in the sense of continuum order parameter models that describe active systems, one of which, for example, is the Turner 2 model, which I assume John Turner will talk about when he arrives. Um, so what I want to do um, is uh, next, before uh, thinking about activity, is just run through a few more of the sort of base case models involving different types of order parameter, mostly passive to begin with, but again, which, which, which will allow us to talk uh, later on about a, a wider class of active field theories. And then I'll zoom in on the simplest ones, which are these things involving a, a scalar field. Um, well, they're not correlated with each other, if that's what you mean, but they both come from T. And you c I think I would say no, because JN is specifically related to the, uh, the diffusion constant or the mobility, which is, if I think of mobility, it's the same as uh, a friction or drag. So that comes from the drag between particles and their surroundings. Uh, this comes specifically from the viscosity. Now, of course, those two are related, but I don't think there's a direct link between this and that. Yeah. 
which terms? Well, this, this, there isn't, the momentum of conservation is here. This is the equation for the time derivative of the momentum density. That's, what's that's what that is. That's big D by dt of rho b. So this equation has to conserve momentum. That equation is not about momentum. It's about particle. It's, it only concerns phi. Do you see what I mean? So phi is telling me about the relative amounts of a and b. The momentum is only concerned with the sum of a plus b times, you know, rho a v a plus rho b v b. Do you see what I mean? So uh, that term doesn't break momentum conservation because it doesn't contradict this equation. It's just telling me about motion in a, di a different direction from the momentum. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so rho is indeed that. Well, it's the mass density, but you know what I mean. And uh, I'm assuming the fluid is incompressible as well, so that's what I've uh, done here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's say a bit about other order parameters, uh, particularly non-conserved order parameters. Still passive. So I mentioned a list, and some of them will probably you'll have seen explicitly. I'm not, not sure though, so I'll just run through a few. Example, polarization, and I can define that this way. So a mesoscopic average of something, which is a vector u, a unit vector u, attached to each particle alpha. So think of a set of rods, for instance. So each rod has an arrow. That's the polarization. So um, if I, again, uh, uh, revert then to the case of a, what's in often called a dry system in the active context, meaning no momentum conservation. So I'm looking at the counterpart of uh, something like Model B for this. It's important that this is not conserved. In other words, these uh, particles, their density is conserved. I can't... Uh, create density without moving particles from one place to another, but each of them can rotate locally, so there's no conservation law on P. So that's why I have this heading here, so I don't need to write that down again. So here's an uh, equation uh, for the time evolution of P. P dot is minus some coefficient df dp. And then again, Fluctuation dissipation tells me that there's got to be a noise term. The noise term is related to this uh, damping here. So it's 2 kBT gamma times a unit wide noise vector. Uh, so this is not of the form div J because there's no conservation law on P, and this is from FDT. as usual. You see I'm trying to get you used to this as usual without ever having derived it, but I will do it at some point eventually, <coughs> at least for one model. Um, so then you have to think about what f is going to look like. Well, uh, again, in the, in the, at the same sort of level as we had with model B, I can think of that as a, some kind of simple polynomial with some gradient terms. So typically, later f equals a over 2 p squared, so mod p squared, b over 4, mod p4. Same kind of shenanigans about, well, it's not so obvious, but this, this is going to be symmetric in p. You would be, it'd be surprising if states of where every particle in the system had swapped direction were not of the same free energy. So this should be symmetric in p. So I don't need to give such an elaborate argument as before. Some k over 2, some gradient term, which in a, a not completely general, but fairly general case can be written like this. Again, dr. So a less than zero gives me spontaneous polarization. Um, 
just for completeness, uh, I can, of course, have a, a non-conserved scalar. So the scalar version of this, or analog, is called model A. Would be the following. Phi dot equals minus gamma df d phi. No conservation law here. 2 kbt gamma scalar unit white noise but you know in obvious one component generalization of the thing we had before uh, so this could describe um, motion in uh, ferromagnets for instance where they the magnet mag if I was a magnetization order parameter it wouldn't have to be conserved unless you have some specific spin flip dynamics that conserves it okay so that's a bit of a, a aside but I can also think of the wet version of this so the case where I, a, a, a polarization vector like that is coupled to a fluid velocity uh, of the kind that we had over here in model H so this is back to P now again non-conserved so I have to then have to have some kind of total derivative which is a co-moving derivative to be defined so I'll say more about what that might look like in a minute and no conservation law so I can write minus gamma H uh, H just being a shorthand for the FDP often called the molecular field and the noise as usual and then I need an equation of motion like this one so it's very like this one in fact all I can do in the Navier-Stokes equation is write it down as before That P is not related to this P. It's a big capital P without a vector underlying. Uh, noise. And now a stress, which is the counterpart of this stress, which uh, is comes from the fact that if I have interactions between these rods, which is responsible for a non-trivial free energy structure in P, that's forces between rods. Those forces are communicated to the fluid and tell the fluid they create a stress which tells the fluid how to move so that's what this term is doing here so stress on fluid if you like from the order parameter And that stress is significantly more complicated than this one I, I mentioned over here. Yes. To be announced. I'm about to announce it. Sorry. Sorry? No. That's in fact div eta grad V plus grad V transpose, which is the divergence. Oh, good Lord. Excuse me. Yes. I beg your pardon. Okay. So let me fill you in on the TBA term. So this is a bit of a complication which comes when you have well, so what we're talking about now is the, the what is the proper co-moving derivative of a vector field P. Now, there was one example, V is a vector field, but it's a very special one because it is the velocity. For it, this is the co-moving derivative. We had a co-moving derivative in model H for phi, which was again phi dot plus v dot, v dot grad phi. But if P is a vector other than the velocity, uh, that's not the most general uh, form for the co-moving derivative. So here's a complication, which is the TBA. So dP 
dt is not just p dot plus v dot grad p. So a way to think about this is to notice that this is trilinear in each of these quantities, v grad p. It has one of each. <coughs> so for a scalar field, or in the case of, of the uh, Navier-Stokes equation for an incompressible fluid, it turns out that the only trilinear is v dot grad v or v dot grad phi. That would, that's not trilinear, it's linear and quadratic. So let's just stick with phi. For scalar phi, v dot grad phi is only trilinear thing. However, that's not true for p. Uh, I'm going to define two things. The first is the symmetrized velocity gradient. And the second is the anti-symmetrized one. Omega ij is half grad i vj minus grad j vi. And um, it turns out that the most general trilinear form is this. dp dt, I'm just going to squeeze this in here, apologies. Um, minus p dot, just put that on the left hand side to be complete about this. Um, three coefficients, chi 1, v dot grad p. Say more about these coefficients in a second. Chi 2, omega dot p, so contraction on the second index of this second rank tensor here. Chi 3, d, again contracted on the second index with p. So I haven't finished yet because I've got to say more about those, those coefficients. where chi 1 is unity. Uh, and this can be shown from Galilean invariance. And it's the same reason that this coefficient here is unity. So uh, if I want the, the, ho the whole system of coupled equations there to have Galilean invariance, then th I have to choose that coefficient to be 1. Chi 2 is also unity. And this follows from something called frame indifference, which is a rather technical subject. Which basically means that rigid rotation of the entire sample must rigidly rotate P. In other words, if I just have a static configuration and I just turn the whole sample, then whatever configuration the, the vector field P has, it must simply rotate. Uh, that's what this omega thing here, what this is doing is it's telling you about the rigid body rotation part of the velocity. This is telling you about the shear part. Uh, so chi 3 is the only thing which actually has a dependence on other stuff and it's normally written as the negative of something called xi and this is a molecular parameter. And this is the conventional rotation. Uh, so there are different limiting cases here uh, of describing cases where P is either co-rotated, simply co-rotated with the rotational part of the flow or where the P moves in such a way that it's a vector that if it's across two streamlines, the two points move separately on the individual streamlines. Uh, these are technicalities. The point is that there is 
one parameter here which depends on the mo molecular character of the particles in the system uh, and there's more details of this on problem two. You may not want more details. Okay, so um, what we've got then is, um, well, I'm not sure I need, need to write, well, I'll just for completeness, I will write this out. I'll put it here if you can see this. P dot plus V dot grad P. Well, I'll put the plus sign here. Omega P minus molecular parameter D P equals minus gamma H plus 2 KBT gamma square root white noise. And then the other equation is the noisy Navier-Stokes equation with sigma p in it. So I still haven't said what sigma p is. I'm just going to quickly tell you what that is, but not derive it in any way. Because that's problem three. Uh, there are not going to be this many problems, don't worry. There's only seven altogether. For five lectures, it's just that three of them are in lecture one. So it's important that this um, this parameter here is ultimately connected to the way that the uh, the particles, the rod-like particles, wherever they are, talk to each other, and um, it's perhaps not so obvious, but nonetheless true that that parameter will also appear, therefore, in the expression for the stress, which is how the uh, disposition of the polarization field issues instructions to the fluid as how to update its velocity. Uh, so this is problem three. All you need to know is the divergence of this, which is that thing. <coughs> and it's got three parts, and let me write them down. And I'm doing this with indices because it's very difficult to get an unambiguous notation without them. Uh, HK, this is from... dot grad p so these these things the reason there's a connection is because uh, the this update here is telling you how the uh, polarization field deforms with movement of the of the sample as points in the sample move with the fluid flow how does p follow and it has to follow in a restricted way except for this c parameter which depends on the actual molecular interaction um, if you think about that, the question of how P evolves when I change the shape of the system is also going to tell me how the free energy evolves as I change the state of the system. And that's what the stress tensor is about. It's about the derivative of the free energy with respect to shape. That's what a stress tensor actually is. So there is a deep connection between each of these uh, terms in the update rule for P and the possible terms you can get in the stress tensor. So that's what I mean by from this term here. Uh, there's also this, pi hj minus hj pi. And this is from the Riesz rotation part in the same sense. And the divergence of now with c over 2, pi hj plus pj hi this is from that term. So as I said, each of these terms tells you about part of the way P updates when the, the system deforms and changes its shape, and each of those has a corresponding contribution back into the stress, which then tells the velocity field what to do next. Okay, so um, that's horrible, um, but I just wanted to, to lay that as groundwork because uh, it will allow me at least to uh, not come back to this when uh, in later discussions of active systems, things like this rear their ugly heads. I just wanted to get this out of the way uh, in the first lecture.
and mostly not even in the lecture, but in the problems which you will wisely decide not to do. Okay, uh, yes, please. Yes. Oh, I, 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 that, yes, of course. Um, yes, so I'm, I'm putting the, these in order of the indices, am I not? So this is symmetric anyway, it doesn't matter how I write it, There's a, that's the only thing there. Um, and I think you're right with that one. Yes, I mean, I, in my notes written down here, I actually have PJHI, but that is the same. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. Um, no, <laughs> that's a whole other can of worms. Uh, so I, I won't go into this, but the, the, the you you the uh, you have an angular momentum density as well in systems which are rod-like, uh, and it is true that in in liquid crystals generally, actually, the stress tensor does not have to be symmetric. There are ways of writing it in the Navier-Stokes equation as a symmetric stress tensor. You can always do that, but then you find that V is not quite the velocity field. This is a total mess. So for now, the best answer is no. In systems with a polar order parameter, the stress tensor need not be symmetric, and the same is true with a nomadic order parameter. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, huh. Well, it is the divergence of a stress. This is explicit. What I've got here is a nice expression for the stress. The reason I've written that is that the stress whose divergence is this is very complicated to write down. So I didn't write it down because all you need is the actual divergence of it. It was rather in, in model H again. I said that div sigma was minus phi grad mu. Now I can construct a stress of which the divergence is always equal to minus phi grad mu, but it has about 16 terms in it and you wouldn't want to see it. So there is such a thing here, but we don't need it. Whereas these terms, the, the easy looking thing is already the stress directly. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop there. If there are uh, further questions, please ask them. And then uh, next time I'm going to start uh, constructing a discussion of the difference between active and passive uh, uh, field theories with the, this background for what the passive cases might look like. Yeah, questions? So you s 